My name is Abigail Reese, and I am an organizer with TIAA Divest. First, we're going to learn more about TIAA Divest, uh, TIA and Nuveen. Then we're going to hear through from Seth Feaster. Um, so if you, and then Jamie Gaither and McGizikway and Mc, Mc, McMillan um, are going to speak together on line three in Enbridge, which is a pipeline that is funded by TIAA because they fund Enbridge. And then we're going to have a call to action. So as you read through tonight's agenda, please make sure that you share your name, location, and what brought you here in the chat, just so can kind of get to know each other. Tonight, we're gonna to have the opportunity to take action together. Um, so please make sure that you can access a Google link. Um, it doesn't matter if you're on your phone or on your computer, just as long as you can click the link in the chat. And if for some reason you can't, you will get all of this in a follow-up email, email after the webinar tonight, as long as you registered for the webinar. Um, I'm seeing a lot of action in the chat, which is awesome. We have people from New York, California, um, from Colorado, Portland, Canada. It looks like we have people from all, so that's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's great to see how many people are here. If you are a TIA a customer uh, or client, please put that in the chat as well when you're sharing what brought you here tonight, because it's just good to know. Welcome. Like I said, my name is Abigail. Um, I am first up for tonight, and I'm also the one that is hosting. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to hear an introduction on TIAAFS and TIAA and Veeam, and kind of learn more about who they are, uh, what they do their investment practices. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. Um, so let's talk about TIAA Divest. So TIAA Divest was founded in 2020 um, by a group of people who had fought against the building of the fracked gas plant in Dover Plains, New York. Um, this was the Cricket Valley fracked gas power plant. Um, they found out that TIA was over a third owner of this plant, right? So their money was actually funding something that they were directly protesting. Um, and they later found out that they were also an investment in Adani Coal and land grabs in Brazil and deforestation. And they just kind of found out that TIA was using their money in really irresponsible ways and directly funding projects that were destroying the environment. Uh, so TIA Divest has four specific demands, and these demands are listed right here up here on the screen, which is an immediate moratorium on all new direct investments in fossil fuels, farmland, timberland, and industrial agricultural production, to divest from all current fossil fuel investments and activities, to divest from all companies engaged in deforestation, and to work with a panel of independent scientific and human rights experts and community stakeholders to assess and report transparently on their climate and social impact. Um, so these are demands that have been given to TIA in various um, capacities. So they are very aware of them and we're very vocal. Um, so TIAA has actually released a climate plan um, and they've said that they're going, a climate action plan, and they have stated that they're going to be um, doing these huge changes, right? But then they, they actually never do them. So actually what TIAA is doing is that they're funding fossil fuels, right? They're um, acquiring land illegally, which is harming black and indigenous farmers at high rates. Um, they're funding projects like Line 3, which is something that we're going to hear about a lot tonight. And I just want to remind you that we're going to have the opportunity to write TIA Board um, of Governors, members of the Board of Governors, and then we're also going to write officials about this. So as people are talking tonight and as you hear these things, make sure that you kind of keep them in your mind or take note so that you can really um, send an email quickly and efficiently, but we'll also give you some of those resources as well too. So why does TIA divest exist? Like, why do we demand that TIA divest? So TIA offers educators, art workers, scholars, and others financial security at retirement by investing in companies feeling environment destruction while pretending to be an environmentally friendly and proactive, com um, and proactive company. So in a time where fossil fuel investments are becoming stranded assets and renewable energy solutions are recognized as the future, this is unacceptable. So as you look up here, you can see some of the things that they're invested in. Um, and as we break it down by project, we can see that they're actually invested in Adani, which just got hit with a huge scandal. In fact, on January 24th, um, Hindenburg Research 
released a report that was two years in the making that said that basically this was the largest con in corporate history. And also TIA manages a substantial amount of investments in a large scale high emission agriculture and timber plantations focus. So this means that this is especially damaging to black farmers and communities of color and indigenous people. So TIA is also directly funding Enbridge and they have 200, an estimated $250 million in Enbridge. So these are some updates about TIA Divest and what they have been up to. So we've had quite a few events. Um, we had activists picket in front of TIA's New York City's office, and we've also had them protest outside of uh, the funds in Man uh, the funds department in Manhattan. Sorry, my computer is freezing right now. Um, we've also made sure to pass resolutions on 11 campuses. So these are the following institutions that have passed resolutions by essentially working to empower educators, staff, and students to organize and demand the TIA stopped uh, financing fossil fuel extraction and infrastructure. On April 2nd, we had a week of action in nine states across the country. We gathered over 21,000 signatures demanding that TIA divest from fossil fuels and stop land grabs. We tried to give it to the CEO, um, but security refused this and did not allow it to happen. Uh, in June, we organized a campaign asking TIA participants to vote no for TIA's proposed board slate. Um, we don't know if it worked because for the first time, TIA actually refused to release the voting results, which is interesting. Oh, sorry, it skipped one. In August, we got the American of Teachers with 1.7 million members to pass a resolution urging TIA to divest from fossil fuels. In September, we confronted the Nuveen CEO at a New York City event and we got his phone number, but he doesn't return the calls. Um, in October, we worked with financial and legal, legal experts and volunteers, worked for six months to develop a carefully researched complaint to the UN sponsor, sponsored principles of responsible investment. We filed the complaint on October, 782 educators who are also TIA participants signed on, including well-known names like Bill McKibben, uh, Naomi Araskis, and Michael Mann. And then we also worked with uh, closely with developing this complaint to make sure that it was really well researched. And we found that the complaint um, had a strong response through back channels. So the complaint found and focused on the fact that TIA has at least 78 billion invested in fossil fuels, um, how it has systemic land acquisitions and land management that are leaked directly to deforestation, um, how they missed lead about how they market their funds, how there's a lack of transparency on the implementation of its net zero commitments, and how there's a lack of accountability to stakeholders. So there was actually over 800 signatories on this PRI complaint, so it was a pretty big complaint. And in December, we worked to amplify this awesome and important report from the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. And this is where we got a lot of the numbers that we actually use in this presentation. So here's just some of the success to date that we have talked about, which is getting that resolution passed, um, getting the Senate resolutions, uh, getting the petitions passed, um, and getting more and more actions across the country. And we've actually had even more with the uh, most recent one being divestment times, which was pretty successful and had us handing out TIA, um, that TIA address Valentine's cards on campuses and in person in New York City. So how can you support TIA Divest? So you can join the campaign at tiadivest.org. Um, we will send this link as well. You can write a letter. This is something that we're going to do today. We will actually have the opportunity to all take direct action. We're going to first hear from speakers on line three, um, which is going to be important because if you remember, TIA is funding Enbridge with over $250 million. And we're also going to hear from Seth Feaster to hear a little bit more about the financial side. So that is something that you can do to support TIA Divest. And then you can also sign our petition. 
And then if you are interested, you can start a TIA divest group at your institution. So these are all things that you will learn how to do um, at the end of this call by receiving a link to a toolkit. And then on top of that, we're also going to be able to onboard you one-on-one -on -one if you find that you're interested in getting more involved. So you can connect with us at this link, which we will send um, in the email and in the chat. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass it on to Seth Feaster. So Seth is an energy data analyst whose work focuses on the coal industry and the US power sector. Before joining AIFA, he created visual presentations at the New York Times for over 25 years. Um, with a focus on complex financial and energy data, he also worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So with that, I will give it to Seth. Thank you. Um, I, I wanna tell you a little bit quickly about uh, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, which is based out of Cleveland. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a recognition by the founders of IEFA that there was a lot of active, a lot of activist organizations who needed support from folks who could do some of the deeper financial analysis on the companies that were involved in fossil fuels. Um, particularly coal is how we started. And so we're a group of people that has grown from uh, four or five people 10 years ago to almost 70 now around the world, um, where we try and support uh, the energy transition, the movement uh, away from fossil fuels by doing financial analysis and providing that information uh, on our website and in support of organizations like TIA Divest. And so that's, uh, I also have a personal interest in TIA because my parents were both uh, in uh, college professors and were involved in uh, investing in TIA uh, through their retirement funds. So this is uh, an issue that uh, comes close to my heart here. So I'm here to talk a little bit about how uh, TIA has an had an investment in a couple of very polluting coal plants, one in Ohio and one in West Virginia. They're called the Pleasants, that's the one in West Virginia, and uh, Samus, that's the one in Ohio. And the way we got here was we've started looking at what, uh, the money from private equity, which is in the trillions of dollars, that's with a T, trillions of dollars in private equity money that is poured into these kinds of investments in fossil fuels, as was mentioned earlier. And um, we've tended to look a lot at um, more traditional private equity firms and um, kind of stumbled on TIAA in this, in, in this case, because TIAA was not an obvious player here. Um, so I'm going to walk through a little bit about how they got here, what they're doing, and give you a little bit of background about private equity. So what is private equity? So what the pension funds have done is um, seek higher returns in order to make up that difference. And the place that they're turning to increasingly has been private equity, which is a branch of Wall Street that was designed for rich investors. And because the government, the SEC, felt that rich investors were um, could afford to lose money and were more financially savvy than ordinary investors, they didn't need to disclose very much. And so there's very little oversight about private equity firms. So a lot of the money that's going from government and corporate pension funds is going into these private equity firms, which are largely a black box. So AIFA has made an effort along with some others who are doing this work now uh, in order to try and, and pull the curtain aside on, on how this money is getting into fossil fuels, into these investments. And uh, one of the key ways is that anybody who's producing electricity uh, for the U.S. market has to disclose in greater detail the ownership of what they of um, the ownership structure of who's owning the power plants, okay? And that is 
other than that, there are very few ways in which we can find out information. So that's how we kind of uh, have approached this. Next step. So we're going to look at a company called First Energy Solutions, which was started in 1997. It was um, intended to be a, a profitable, competitive energy market subsidiary of First Energy based out of Ohio. First Energy owns uh, 10 regulated utilities, and those utilities cover customers from New Jersey through Ohio um, in, in a huge swath of the sort of uh, upper Midwest and the, and the mid-Atlantic. So First Energy is a huge utility. And um, they were, but they started FES to be uh, part of the unregulated energy market, thinking that they could make a lot of money. But that didn't work out really well. And by 2016, the generation plants, particularly the nuclear plants, and two of the coal-fired power plants that First Energy owned, um, were under intense financial pressure, partly because of the cheaper power coming from gas plants. Uh, uh, PJM is the, the grid area in the Northeast that um, this that um, First Energy is part of. And in 2018, uh, First Energy Solutions declared bankruptcy. Um, they had tried to close Pleasance and Samus, then they tried to push them into the regulated utility. They were blocked. We put out, we had a very strong effort to try and block that because it meant that ratepayers were going to be paying for these coal plants. That failed. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, First Energy went into bankruptcy. During, you know, um, not long after they came out of that bankruptcy, First Energy was discovered to have been paying bribes to get try and get a billion dollars in subsidies for their nuclear plants in a bill called HB6 in Ohio. It brought down the Speaker of the Ohio House, um, and there is a there was a federal trial that was just going on uh, this past month uh, in Ohio over this scandal. It was a huge scandal. In the end, First Energy Solutions and First Energy did not get any money for the nuclear plants um, that I'm gonna be talking about here. They changed their name when they came out of bankruptcy to Energy Harbor. And because of the bankruptcy, it would be owned by its creditors. Now, who are those creditors? Next slide, please. Uh, th by the way, these are the, so let's go back. Th these are the two coal plants. Let's go back one. These are the two coal plants that we're talking about. Pleasance in West Virginia, Samus in Ohio, Pleasant, just to give you some sense of the scale of these plants, um, Pleasance alone produced 9.2 million tons of carbon dioxide um, in 2021. Samus uh, produced 6.3 million tons of carbon dioxide in 2021 alone, right? So together, these are uh, more than 15 million tons of carbon dioxide. So this is a significant uh, climate impact um, power plants, these two coal plants. Next slide, please. Well, it came out uh, after the bankruptcy when they had to declare who the new owners of Energy Harbor were, that TIA through Nuveen was a between 35 and 40% owner of Energy Harbor and Avenue Capital, another private equity firm owned 15 to 20%. Now there are other owners who were creditors, they did not have to be disclosed. There is a threshold. So we don't know who those other owners actually are. We suspect that there are largely other um, hedge funds and lenders to Energy Harbor. Now, how did TIA even get here? Because TIA is not a normal private equity firm. What TIA did though, was at some point before the bankruptcy, they lent money to First Energy Solutions. That was a loan of some kind. They, they are a creditor. They were a creditor. And yet they ended up being the biggest owner of the company as it went through bankruptcy, which is how they became the biggest owner out of bankruptcy. Okay. So this is the structure. Don't be put off by this, but this gives you some sense of the structure here that we have to sift through in order to figure out uh, what's going on. But this is an, uh, a surprising level of disclosure, which is unusual in the private equity world. It only happens because it's a power plant. 
And what you will see here is that Nuveen somehow through these 25 funds, which are mostly municipal bond funds, was the lender to first energy solutions, which became Energy Harbor, okay? That's how they owned, for example, Pleasance, um, but also how they own, ended up owning Samus, okay? So it's really surprising because this is not where you would necessarily think this money would be coming from. These are municipal bond funds largely, particularly state municipal bond funds. I don't know that anybody who is an investor at TIA in the Kansas municipal bond fund would have suspected that they were investing in coal plants in Ohio and West Virginia. Next slide, please. So you were may very well have been if you were a TIA um, retiree or prospective retiree, that if you owned any of those funds in your retirement account, you may have unwittingly owned a piece of these coal plants. Um, not at all obvious to anybody who was trying to make those investments. Next slide, please. Okay. So in the latest update here, Energy Harbor a year ago unveiled a plan to become a 100% carbon-free uh, energy infrastructure and supply company. Okay. And they were saying then that they were going to exit the fossil business. So far, so good through a sale or deactivation of its Samus and Pleasance power plants, okay? Now, what they did was they said, okay, we're gonna close those two power plants or sell them by May 31st, 2023. So just a couple of months from now. However, they had the opportunity to permanently close those two coal plants. Instead, what they did was in December, they sold them on to a company called Energy Transition and Environmental Management, which sounds lovely. They are supposed to do the environmental remediation, even though they had this company, which is owned itself by a um, investment firm and has never done a coal plant uh, remediation, which means cleaning it up, uh, tearing down the coal plant or whatever infrastructure needs to be torn down. We don't know the details of what of the arrangement that TIA had with them, except that they sold them to ETEM and leased them back until the end of May. However, ETEM can sell them on and potentially make a profit, we don't know, um, instead of closing and cleaning them up. And that's the problem. One of the things here that we are concerned about um, at IEFA is that companies like Energy Harbor are saying, hey, look, we're doing all this wonderful work. We're close, you know, we no longer own fossil fuels, except that the emissions from those two coal plants, if they are sold on to somebody else, another uh, private equity firm or another company that wants to operate them, those, that pollution doesn't go away. It is not, in fact, really a, a acceptable for um, Energy Harbor to say, look, we, you know, we did all this wonderful things. All they did was move the pollution to somebody else. Okay. That's not really the solution that we're looking for here. Um, and it raises a whole bunch of questions about th this whole process that TIA did raise a whole bunch of questions about what they're doing with their investments and their due diligence. It basically, um, it lent money. It became a creditor to a company that was already troubled financially and then went through bankruptcy. Okay, it doesn't sound like a great investment and doesn't sound like they might have done very much work in order to figure out that they were already in trouble. This was a signaled a long time ago, um, as early as 2016, if not earlier. Uh, we don't know when TIA made its investment, but it wasn't a particularly wise investment on the surface. And um, that's partly proven by the fact that less than two years after emerging from bankruptcy, the company that they're now the owners of decided to close those two major assets as economically unviable, okay? We also don't know what kind of a deal did TIA have with ETM? Did they have to pay them a bunch of money? Did they actually make any money from selling these two plants? We guess not because cleaning up coal plants um, is a pretty expensive endeavor. It's unlikely that TIA made any particular kind of money, it may have cost them a lot of money, in fact, 
Uh, we just don't know because they haven't disclosed any of this. I just wanted to give you an oversight, uh, an overview here of how a firm like TIA can get itself involved in some very, let's call them climate unfriendly investments um, in very untransparent way. That's um, our effort to try and shine a little light into some of what's going on here in this, in this process. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. So up next, we've got Jamie Geither and Magizikwe McMillan. Um, Jamie is a climate activist living adjacent to the Enbridge Line 3 corridor, just three miles of north of its Mississippi headwaters crossing. A retired metallurgical engineer, she has worked with Wadwakan Amigwag, those who help beaver, an indigenous citizen scientist group documenting the damage from Enbridge Line 3. And um, we're also going to make sure that we keep ourselves muted while she is talking. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic on. All right, thank you so much. So up next, we've got Jamie Geither and Magizikwe McMillan. Um, Jamie is a climate activist living adjacent to the Enbridge Line 3 corridor, just three miles of north of its Mississippi headwaters crossing. A retired metallurgical engineer, she has worked with Wadwakan Amigwag, those who help beaver, an indigenous citizen scientist group documenting the damage from Enbridge Line 3. And um, we're also going to make sure that we keep ourselves muted while she is talking. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic on. Bonjour, Gukina. We are Jamie Gaither and Dijna Kaz, now in Nimbagianan, in Dunjaba, now a Kalandan, Ungum, Besho Gawa Babigani Kag, Minoa, Besho Enbridge Line 393, Tumukamana Uh Some people will say, why is this white woman introducing herself in the Ojibwe language? And I'll tell you, it's because this verb based language has really helped me to understand not only the land and the people, but how everything is interconnected here. Um, so what I said in English is my name, uh, hello everyone, my name is Jamie Gaither. I live, I come from the Midwest and I live in the middle of the forest now near White Earth Reservation. My husband and I are abutters to the Line 393 pipeline here in the heart of Clearwater County. Um, where we've seen quite a lot of damage from this project. So today um, we're going to talk about this company that's making billions of dollars. And the reason they can keep doing what they're doing is because of funders like TIAA. And we're going to talk about how we just stop this investment in our mutual destruction. And this, this goes back, don't pay a lot of attention to the names of the pipelines necessarily or what they're carrying. This, this really starts decades ago when oil companies began running pipelines through Indian country here in northern Minnesota. And some of these reservations now have more than a half a dozen oil pipelines running through. Um, but, but line three really starts back in November of 2013 when Enbridge was trying to build a pipeline called Sam Piper. And it was from the Bakken, the Minnesota PUC immediately, the Public Utilities Commission said, hey, yep, you guys can do this. And yeah, you can do that environmental impact statement later. And this really caused a lot of public outroar. We stood up, uh, many people stood up, uh, and indigenous groups like Honor the Earth and, and other groups like uh, Friends of the Headwaters began suing uh, Enbridge and suing the state and saying this was not right. And after three years, Enbridge finally decided, hey, we're gonna go over and join Marathon Petroleum in that Dakota Access Pipeline. And a month later, they told Minnesota, you know that pipeline we really, really needed, we told you we couldn't live without, well, we're gonna cancel that project. Well, what was going on in the background is in April of 2024, or April of 2015, they had already asked the Utilities Commission for the Line 3 replacement. And again, we saw legal and local pressures delaying the, the beginning of this pipeline. And so they didn't actually start construction until November of 2020. And this led to huge cost overruns. This project initially was about 2.6 billion, and now it's a $4 billion plus project. And the only reason they can afford to keep doing things like this is because of the funding that they get. We stop the funding, we stop the insanity. Part of what we're stop, trying to stop is these threaten, threats to Anishinaabe land, the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, Red Lake Nation. All of these ceded lands ha retain treaty rights, and those rights guarantee the right to hunt and fish and gather medicines from the land. Um, well, well, when we see companies like Enbridge coming in and poisoning the water, what good does a right to harvest dead fish give you? 
And so we've really talked a lot about how these pipelines were illegally approved against the wishes of the tribal nations that are in this state and upon whose lands we see direct impacts. And we need to not forget about Dakota people as well, because these two crossings of this Tarsians pipeline um, of the Mississippi, that water's going right down to the bottom of the state there in Dakota lands and onto the Gulf of Mexico, affecting a lot of us. And so one of the things we see in this picture is how people stood up. We delayed, all these delays kept years of tar sands in the ground. So neither Enbridge nor the state was really watching what was going on. Um, we had, I, I, this is the Mississippi River here. We had Camp Firelight fi pa um, parked here on the ditch because we were watching as they were drilling under Mississippi River. And you can see here the remnants of the timber matting, which uh, it shows just how dangerous and damaging this is to the land. And so groups like citizens, like uh, Waduka Wadamikwag, those who help beaver, this is a group of citizen scientists following indigenous cultural values. We're watching what's going on. And while people stood up, we saw a thousand plus citizens arrested by Minnesota law enforcement. And again, this is TIAA's money. Enbridge ended up spending $8.5 million arresting citizens to silence the voices of opposition. Our concerns really, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, pipeline spills, but the bigger and current concerns are really the construction damages. We have already seen impacts. When Enbridge came through, they burst through, the public has been notified of three burst aquifers where they pounded steel pilings 30 feet into the ground in order to support the trench in which they installed their pipeline. And here you can see where they're still measuring last summer, water coming out of the ground. Unrelenting water flow continues in one of the locations. This is a higher picture of the Mississippi corridor. And you can see in this thermal imaging, the wounds that remain in the land. Last summer, my husband went out and took this picture of a four foot by six foot hole above the pipeline and a location, one of the final locations Enbridge did, Walker Brook Crossing. The hole in the pipeline is here. What happened is the pipeline acted like a French drain, pulling water in to the land at the bottom of the hill here. And they had to reinstall timber matting last summer and totally redo this location. Um, this location was never disclosed to the public. So what we're trying to do is stop what the public believes from Enbridge and show them the truth about what's happening. And now I wanna turn it over to uh, Mgizikwe, my friend who has taught me so much in the last six months about the fact that water is not a resource, she's a relative. So Miigwech, thank you for listening. Miigwech Bizendawieg. Mgizikwe, here's to you. Bujun Bidale Margana Duk Mikizikwe and Dijan Kars Mikizin into Dim Gil, Benesi Nagach and Ung and Dunj Ba. Mikizikwe McMillan, I'm from the Fonwag Band. Um, I'm a first descendant, meaning I'm not an enrolled band member. Since the IRA government structure has been um, put onto our people, our um, in what is it? Um, yeah, ever since the IRA got put onto our people, our membership criteria has changed. It used to be all descendants were included with everything, and it created a division in our tribes. Um, but I'm I'm here today to share about life on the reservation before and after Enbridge, about the sense of community. Um, our tribal government, which is called the Reservation Business Committee, uh, the cost of living and the after effects. Um, before Enbridge came through, um, our government was pretty self-sufficient. We were making enough money and saving enough money that um, we had three accounts, account A, B, and C, and the interest off of account A would pay all of our tribe's bills, even if a bit one of our business ventures was failing. Um, it would still, it wouldn't hurt our, our base funding that we had for ourselves. And descendants used to be able to get a lot of help on the reservation, even though they weren't enrolled. Even band members were getting help that we don't see anymore. When Enbridge came through, um, it just seemed like disruption in our people. Um, high paying jobs were creating an exodus from tribal operation jobs. And so many of our needed positions were left unfilled for a long time, especially over COVID this last time. 
Um, and so our tribal operations have really been struggling for a long time now. Um, our reservation business committee used to be really helpful and now they, well before, they got paid almost as any other civic duty person would get paid. And after Enbridge came through, their salaries have doubled and tripled and quadrupled. Even though the second time Enbridge came through, they had already kind of liquidated our account A, B, and C because of all the money promised by Enbridge. And now all the money that we have pretty much is dependent on Enbridge. The money that Fond du Lac received is pretty much all we have to operate on because of COVID has changed everything. We don't have much revenue from our casinos anymore. And so we're, I mean, really dependent when we were very independent before. The cost of living has gone up with the quick trips and the Enbridge and other subcontractors. Their wages are so much higher than anybody's seen around here. And it's causing many mom and pop shop, grocery stores, gas stations to be going out of business. Um, it's causing a lot of hardship for many to be able to meet daily needs. Um, after Enbridge leaves the reservation, these people are without that income. And none of us have really had much education about how um, economic education on how to save money and how to take care of huge in income fluctuations like that. And so some of our people get really self-defeated. They were doing really well, making a lot of money. And now what are they doing? What can they do? And then they, I think it really dumps morale. Um, before Enbridge, our families got together and we'd take care of each other no matter if money was an object or issue at all. And now it seems like we can't even help each other if we wanted to because there's not enough resources to help ourselves. And it's getting to be a real struggle that way. Um, drug trafficking and human trafficking seems to go up when they are around. I think there's a lot of data on that as well. Um, it just seems like as, as soon as Enbridge comes around, there's harder drugs around. Before Enbridge, there was a lot of drinking and maybe marijuana use, but there wasn't very much meth or cocaine or heroin or meth, um, all those drugs. And now they seem to be just saturated on our reservation to the point where we're losing our youth at an, an alarming rate. Um, and with our population numbers as it is, we're going to run out of band members. And then what happens to our rights? And right now we're currently trying to change our constitution to include more band members, to include our members as we once had and trying to work that out. But every time Enbridge comes through, there's division over whether to let them or not, or if we need their money or not. And it just, it's making for situations where we never get to fully heal from what's already happened. And we have to wade through even more issues and troubles instead of being able to address our root problems and be able to fix them through a new constitution. Um, it's just heartbreaking to see family members and people you've known your whole life just steadily being used and abused by a company and then watching everything happen around us and being powerless to it really. Um, as a descendant, I'm not allowed to speak on behalf of my children or my family in reservation business committee meetings. Um, even being a ricer, you can see in that picture there, that's our wild rice. So that's what's kept us in existence and thriving, even though annuity payments to treaties were never paid even though we were locked on our reservations and not allowed to leave. Even though, you know, we just, we have been in poverty forever and that's that's the grain that has everything we need to survive. And now Enbridge has put their pipeline all the way through 
our wild rice beds and are threatening them in our way of life. Because if we're if we cannot carry out our treaty responsibilities and our Anishinaabe responsibilities of gathering that rice, taking doing all these things with the land, there's like thousands of medicine. That's our pharmacy, that's our grocery store, that is everything of who we are. And every aquifer breach, every contamination, every grout injection um, is just causing so much havoc. Uh, Mud Lake on the reservation this year did not have any rice on it. And that has been a very good lake for many, many years, if, you know, generations. And um, it's just never ending. And the problems keep compounding. And it's exhausting for our people. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. And thank you, Seth, for uh, taking time tonight to join us. Um, so before we write letters to TIA executives and members of the board, we're going to give everybody the chance to ask questions. Um, so if you have a question, we're going to ask you to please send your name in the chat. You can address the question to any of the speakers, um, or they could be um, questions about TIA divest. And there will be, as as Bill, um, one of our coordinating committee members says, there will be a longer Q and A discussion at the end of of our session today. So, Jamie, um, you want to ask your question, or do you want to turn on your mic and um, um, ask your question directly, Jamie? Again, I, I was just really overwhelmed by how secretive all of these things seem, Seth. I, I'm just wondering, what are what are the things that we really need to do besides talking to folks like TAA? Are there, what can we do to stop the secrecy, to make things more? I mean, that feels like what Wadukwood is doing here is we're trying to make what the state and Enbridge are trying to keep under wraps. We're bringing that to light and saying, hey, this is what's really going on. They're not telling you the whole story. We're doing that with the agencies. What? How do we break that tr that secrecy and that that inability to see what's really going on with with our funds? That's that's a great question. Uh, it's very challenging, um, to say the least. Uh, we at AIFA, there's quite a you know we count among our men, our you know senior people the former. Deputy State Comptroller for the State of New York, who is an expert on this stuff, and so we we have um, some deep knowledge on this, but it doesn't make it easier to break this break into this black box of secrecy, and um, not to be conspiratorial here, but there is a very solid reason for that lack of transparency because if we don't know what they're doing, it's much harder to organize and become active against what's actually going on here. And that's part of what my work and others is here to try and do is, is to break that bond. Now, one of the things that, you know, so there are several links here with a fund like the New York State Common Retirement Fund. Um, you can, we can advocate for transparency first. That is a, the first step. Like TIA should be having greater disclosure about what it is that they're investing in and what they're doing with that money. Um, so that can be that that can be directly at TIA itself. It can be at government regulators who should be forcing TIA in order to increase the level of disclosure around their investments and lending. Um, and, you know, but also there is a disconnect here with these, in particular with a large university and state uh, pension funds, this sort of willful ignorance, okay? Um, there is a willingness to be uh, very passive about letting private equity money do what it wants and not ask too many questions about what they're investing in. And even in a place where I am in New York City, where the New York City um, pension funds are really at the forefront of trying to increase transparency, increase their analysis of carbon impact, it is, ironically, private equity is not one of the areas that they're going to focus on at first. Why? Because they, even though they know what 
the investments are that private equity has made in their name, they're unwilling to pressure the private equity firms to have greater disclosure about what those investments actually are. So um, now that's just the direct investment stuff. That's just owning um, fossil fuel plants, okay? That's just owning pipelines or investments in Enbridge. What's even harder to figure out is this lending. So if they're lending Enbridge money or they're lending some, but let's say they're lending ExxonMobil money, it's harder to figure that out than a direct investment in ExxonMobil stock. So um, I think speaking for myself, that transparency, public pressure around the issue of transparency and disclosure is a very small but important first step to try and put pressure on the pension funds, on TIA, uh, in order to have greater disclosure around, so that we, all of us can even figure out what's going on here, right? That's, that's the first step. Um, the second step is to create an environment where that transparency forces private equity to start separating its investments in fossil fuels from investments in things like bridges or investments in um, renewable energy. And to be fair, there is an enormous and growing amount of um, money from private equity that's going into renewable investments and things that we actually support. Um, but that, you know, the but if they just put all that stuff together in one fund and they call it an infrastructure fund, you have no idea whether that's, you know, you don't want your money to go to a wind farm and to, to uh, a coal plant, right? So the separation of those kinds of funds, the investments in those funds into sort of the fossil fuel stuff, putting it aside from the renewable stuff would be also an important step. Thank, thank you so much, Seth. Um, we have one question which leads into our action portion and then a whole slew of additional questions. And I think we will bring up um, Sally's question, what can we do to change TIA actions? Well, we're gonna do it right now with some actions and then we will come back and take the additional excellent questions we have um, and have time to talk about them. But right now I'm gonna turn it back to Abigail because um, the answer to what we can do is we can, um, among the things, among the first things we can do is right here on this call, we can start sending letters to senior executives and people on the governance board of TIA. Thank you, Dan. So as uh, Dan just said, we're going to move on to an action. So I'm going to chat a link in to everyone and it is going to lead you to a document that is going to walk you through this short 10 minute action. But before we get started um, with my directions, I want you all to feel free to click on this link, read through the document, get any questions that you might have. We're gonna hear from Virginia about why doing this is important. Yeah, so Jamie asked about, um, you know, what can we do? And um, I know myself included, we sometimes scoff at letter writing and email writing, or if we don't scoff at it, we just, how much time, you know, how many letters can you write? But there are two things to know. And one is that um, research shows that it actually is one of the most successful strategies for reaching people in power, whether they're politicians or CEOs. Um, it, you know, they care what the public thinks. So when there are large numbers of people like the 50 people on this call, hopefully um, TIA CEOs will, will get emails from you and, and they're running scared already, quite frankly. The second thing is that, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's a tipping point in the climate movement right now, but it's definitely a moment. And the reason is that we're here at TIA Divest. There are groups working with, um, uh, Fidelity and Vanguard and BlackRock, there are groups working against um, Adani Cole. And not only are all those groups working, but they're really working together more than um, I've known in the past. And it's, it's really leading to a very powerful um, set of possibilities. So um, Abigail is going to um, help you Think about there are a couple of ways to do it and she's going to steer you through what those ways are. Abigail. Yes. Hi. So um, I'm seeing over 
18 people on the document, which is awesome, but there's over 50 people here. So I encourage everybody to take time to look at this document. Um, so what we're doing today is we are taking 10 minutes. Uh, it is 5.58 my time in Colorado. So uh, around 6.08, we're gonna call it time uh, to write emails to the CEOs and board members of TIA to demand that they divest from climate destruction and to hold them accountable for a lot of the things that we discussed tonight on this webinar. So in order to do this, we're going to first choose a topic. And if you look at this document, there are some examples that you can use for line three or 93 or um, just general divestment. And so go ahead and use that to support anything that you would like to write. And then you're going to go ahead and draft your short email. Once your email is drafted, you're gonna come back here and you're gonna grab these different emails. We've got the Sunda Brown Ducket, which is the TIA CEO. Jose Minoya, which is the Nuveen CEO, and we keep going and we highlight each of those and put them in the send box. So just to recap, we're going to choose a topic or you can do multiple topics, draft a letter and essentially demand that they divest from climate change. If you also look on this document, our demands are on here as well. So you can include those two if you want to and just copy and paste them. I'm now seeing over 35 people on the document, so that is awesome. Um, so what are we asking? We are emailing to demand that TIA divest from climate destruction and cease its greenwashing practices. There are a few different topics you can write TIA about. The goal is to write and send a coordinated email campaign um, to put direct pressure on them. And so we ask you to take time to do this right now. So this can be a short email at the moment and you can write a much longer, more in-depth email with more of your personal thoughts later on if you uh, feel the need to. And you will also get a link to this document after the webinar, should you choose to continue um, the conversation or if you know anybody else that's interested. So as you move through the document, you'll see that we have a section on line three, which just has some facts about line three besides what we heard from the presentation. We've got some on the general um, work for divestment. And then finally, our demands. And at the very bottom of the document is an example email that you can use where we ask you if you are a TIA participant to identify yourself. Um, so you can just go ahead and copy that example email or you can write one right now. So I see a question about the document. I'm sending it in the chat. I can send it to you one more time. And does anybody else have any questions about this action? So Abigail, I wanna, I wanna say one thing about uh, TIAA's goal of net zero by 2050. That date, which a few years ago might've seemed um, like they had some foresight about this is now among the laggards, even among the biggest utilities in the country. Most utilities have um, net zero goals of somewhere between um, 2035 and 2045. So TIA is now a laggard in this area. And some of the most aggressive utilities have 2030 net zero dates to give you some idea of comparison about, you know, just the lack of ambition here at TIA. And on top of that, there, the, the net zero goal for the general account that's only a small portion of all the money that they are managing at this point. Thank you for that clarification. And I'm getting uh, quite a few private messages. So I just want to uh, answer all of those. Yes, these links will be sent out after the meeting. Um, please feel free to copy. I just sent the emails in the chat too, if you are not able to access that Google document so that you can just grab the emails from there and see who we're emailing as well. Um, but if you want them to be a little bit easier to read, they're in that Google document. And we've got about one more minute. So thank you everybody for taking time to do this. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Dan so that we can get even more um, questions answered from that Q&A. And yes, you will get this document. So don't worry, it's not gonna disappear when you log off of Zoom. I'm gonna go back to the questions that were already there. Um, so that people who did ask questions don't get their place lost in the chat. And the next question I see, um, and I apologize if I'm misreading the chat, but 
The next question I read is from, and if I mispronounce your name, I apologize, Richenda Kramer. And Richenda, if you're there, please, if you want to, unmute and turn on and speak. And if you prefer, um, I can read your question. Just let us know. Um, I just had, I mean, how does TIA compare with similar organizations? I mean, does everybody do this? BlackRock and all the, I mean, is are they all doing the same thing or are any of them any better, any more transparent or more concerned about the climate? Who would like to take that one? Bill, please. Well, from, from what we've researched, there there aren't um, a ton of uh, of investment companies who are taking climate crisis seriously. That being said, um, you know we are particularly upset with TIAA because of two reasons. First of all, because they incessantly claim that they are um, a responsible investor. They splash photographs of green forests and clean oceans all around their website. Um, they, um, they, they have radio ads uh, talking about their responsible investing and they are um, really as bad or worse than, than most. Um, the second reason is because um, they are a little bit of a different beast. They were created specifically to provide retirement benefits for educators, not for profit employees, um, people who um, really care about other people and really care about the planet. And TIA's um, hypocrisy is, is manifest. And um, at the very least, if they're not gonna change their, their, uh, their investment strategies, they should at least stop claiming that they're, that they're clean and green. But um, our goal is to see them change their investment strategies, and we think you can help us. And then I have Janet Kelly um, with a question follow-up. Janet, you're muted, Janet. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So my question was for Seth. And I, what I was wondering was um, the example that you presented uh, about Harbor Energy, is that just one of the most egregious examples of uh, TIAA's investment practices? Or um, are there many others? Or are there many others that we don't even know about because of the lack of transparency? Great question. The typicality, Seth. Uh, the short answer is it's probably not the most egregious example, and it was it was hidden from us because it wasn't a direct investment. It was being a creditor, and the only way we found out about it is because the company had to go through bankruptcy, and TIA ended up as an owner. Um, the the hypocrisy that Bill mentioned is particularly galling. Um, yet there is plenty of hypocrisy out there. Uh, the way that we at AIFA kind of got started on some of this is the New York State Common Retirement Fund, which also pays a lot of lip service to um, being a responsible investor, an engaged investor, um, caring about the environment, et cetera, because of the constituency here in New York, um, turns out that they, through one of their investments, were part owner in the fourth most polluting coal plant in the United States, which was the Gavin plant. And so when we started to, un as we dig, um, kind of like investigative reporters, we the more we dig, the more we discover. Um, and that's the unfortunate truth here about this whole hidden part of this this part of the banking system, right? It's the, they, there's a term for it. It's part of the shadow banking system. And they like that shadow because if they don't have transparency, if they don't have disclosure, nobody is going to raise a ruckus about it. And um, Part of the reason I'm excited to see this many TIA interested folks here is of all the private equity firms that are out there, TIA does in fact seem to have a particular responsibility that's different than other private equity firms to its, to its retiree constituents. Um, they are perhaps the most educated, the most vocal, and it is also the most direct be connection between the investors and the investment firm. Uh, you're all members, I assume, but like my mother, in those investments at TIA, and they are the ones doing the investing. Unlike um, 
New York State government employees, which have an intermediary a couple of steps a away from that. So um, yeah, that, that's the short answer, I guess. So, so do we know anything about the people at TIA who make the investments? You know, like, do they have ties to the fossil fuel industry? Iris. Uh, so what we find often with TI, we don't know everyone, obviously it's a big corporation and Nuveen is the corporation that actually makes the investments for TIAA. So Nuveen is called a TIAA company. They're the investment manager. So um, we had a couple of volunteers who bird dogged their CIO, which is their investment um, officer, chief investment officer at an event where she was being celebrated. Um, and what I just happened to notice when I looked at her background a little bit is JP Morgan, the son to Brown Duckett, who is the CEO of TIA, has a long, deep background with JP Morgan. A lot of the folks tend to have background in finance um, or for example, uh, Saira Malik, who was the CIO at Nuveen, was had been on the board of, of Cal Poly, and we were discussing about how California Polytechnic is not divesting from fossil fuels, even though other California universities are. Um, so yeah, we're not seeing a whole lot of uh, direct connections to oil and gas, but it's more the financial industry overall and their stubbornness. The other thing about the character of TIAA um, that I think it's important for people to know is that with the vast powerful movement against apartheid in South Africa, you know, we had over a hundred universities divesting from businesses that do business in South Africa, major institutions were divesting one after another. TIA was one of the very last. They only divested when it was almost impossible not to divest. So they're very conservative and they need a lot of pressure, a ton of pressure, which is what makes us so happy to see all of you. We have a question, Paige, Paige Fortna, which is, I think, a particularly important question to, to raise. Yeah, thanks. My question is about the funds within TIA that are socially responsible or ESG, you know, labeled ESG. Um, are they less bad than others? Is moving money, more money into those funds and out of other funds, uh, you know, a, a partial solution or a signal to TIA about how much we're willing to put our money where our mouth is on these things, or are they a sham? Caroline. Go for it. I'm so glad you asked that question. It's something we were really shocked to discover, um, which is that the ESG and social choice funds that TIA advertises are actually worse in terms of exposure to fossil fuels than their general account. Um, and we found this uh, through a website called fossilfreefunds.org, where you can look up any fund that you like um, and, and see how, how much investment it has in fossil fuels. The reason we think that TIAA bills those as socially responsible funds is that TIA has decided that fracked gas is a clean, renewable fuel. Um, uh, and so there's like Halliburton and XL Energy, and those are the kinds of fossil fuels that are in the ESG funds. Um, so no scientist on <laughs> it, it, no respectable scientist uh, would would agree that those are those are clean fuels. So um, uh, yes, I'll definitely put the fossil free funds address in the chat. And I recommend just for the heck of it, uh, typing in TIAA and you'll see all their funds come up um, and all the new bean funds and things, and they get grades from fossil free funds. And you can see a lot of them get C's and D's and you can see where they're invested and what percentage of the portfolio is in um, fossil fuels. So it's a sham uh, and it's actually better to put your money in the general account. That's distressing. Yeah. Um, we have a question next, as I see it in the chat from May Dick.
Well, it's just a, a pretty uh, basic uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if there are any uh, regulations related to um, uh, access of information for people who have their funds invested in TIA. Who would like to take that one? I mean, I, I will give a quick answer and that there are some disclosure regulations, but I think it's pretty clear from the um, presentation we've had today that they are profoundly inadequate and they are profoundly inadequate for new forms of investment. I think one of the things that we see in the history of finance, financial firms is that without regulation, they respond to an existing regulation disclosed by coming up with a new form of investment that isn't covered so they can have a new form of opacity. Um, and that has been particularly true since the onset of the era of deregulation around 1980. Um, and I think the answer is there are, but they don't apply to the kinds of investments they're doing with private equity funds. And so we have opacity to the max. Um, we have another question from um, Natalie Pulver. Natalie, are you there? I think Natalie's question is a good one. It echoes, I'm going to read it because it echoes something we've heard before. Is there efforts to get colleges and universities um, to go for other um, funds? And that is a possibility. There are a lot of difficulties with that at particular institutions, and that's institution by institution. But there's also the problem that Bill raised earlier, which is that the available large firms um, aren't better than TIA. So you'd be picking your poison. There are some better small firms, um, but um, it would be difficult in many, many institutions to get the institution to switch to them. And we are hopeful because TIA, and Seth said this, because TIA has such a highly educated and generally quite principled um, set of participants, investors who, who are committed to the divesting from the climate destruction, we think that there's an excellent chance that by getting your participation that we will force TIA to change. And that will be a bellwether that, they, that investing in land grabs and fossil fuels does not have legitimacy. And we think it can be a cutting edge to massive divestment after that. Um, yeah, I, I would like to add a little bit to that, which is that uh, the I think one of the first steps has to be um, pressure to create alternatives. Um, that is perhaps one of the more palatable solutions that TIA might even consider. And then uh, TIA holders can vote with their feet. They can, they can go to those um, funds if TIA will create them that are more clearly fossil fuel free. Um, we think that in the regular P, uh, private equity world, that the um, pension funds like the New York State Common Retirement Fund can also put a lot of pressure on private equity firms to create alternatives that don't have fossil investments in them. And uh, then that makes it much easier to, for people to move their money, to make decisions around this. And um, I think the private equity firms are afraid of that happening to some extent. Um, but they're also more afraid of the publicity that comes from having the disclosure that they are making these kinds of investments in the first place. We have a question, actually two questions from Randolph um, and Randolph Watts, if you can unmute and pick one of your questions so that we get as many people chance to ask questions as possible. Thank you, Randolph. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, I'm I'm concerned that the uh, uh, investment firms would seek to hide behind an excuse of saying, well, we have a, a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profits for our investors. And I wonder if there's a way that that, that concept can be expanded to say, well, yes, we, we have a fiduciary responsibility to do this in a long-term sustainable way. Uh, is, is, does someone um, in this group have a, um, 
idea how that might be might happen. Thank you. Iris, do you want to talk about that? I see your hand up. Sure. I know a number of us could talk about that, <clears throat> but uh, two things. One is that uh, Tom Tanzillo of AIFA argues very cogently that TIAA is violating its fiduciary responsibility by refusing to consider divestment from fossil fuels for lots of good reasons. Funds that don't have fossil fuels do better in the long run. There is volatility, there's risk, there's stranded assets, not to mention ethics, morals, and survival. Um, and then the, the other reason is that fiduciary responsibility actually originally didn't just mean money. It, and it actually um, can be argued that in terms of the law, it means the, the well-being of the investor, not mm -hmm. just the pocketbook. So when people are dying, when people are drowning, burning, freezing, migrating, uh, when their family members are killed, you know, it's um, it's not good. So my understanding is that Harvard uh, divestment movement threatened a lawsuit or filed a lawsuit along those lines. And that that, in addition to the 10 years of brilliant, creative, hardcore protests, um, and organizing on the part of Harvard students is partly why Harvard finally capitulated. So really great question about fiduciary duty. Never let them hide behind that argument. It's BS. And, and a key aspect of that response from Iris is the concept of a stranded asset that if not now, at some point in the future, we can expect it will be illegal to um, extract and burn fossil fuels. And then whoever is invested in them will have assets that are stranded at, with no monetary value. Virginia, you want to come no, in? I, I would just add that actually um, I've become aware in the last year or two that there are that there's a healthy debate going on within the financial community um, about this. There are articles being written and op-eds being written. And so, um, you know, and and it would be great for some of you to write an article like that uh, or an op-ed like that, uh, because it, they're very basic questions of, of humanity. And you don't have to have uh, a degree in high finance to be able to articulate those issues. Abigail, do we have time for one more question or are we ready to wrap up and we will be sending everybody who has been here and registered follow-up information, but Abigail. We are scheduled until 45. So um, if there is more questions and people are willing to stay, we can continue to ask them. Okay. I'd, I'd like to add to the to the question there. Um, the two coal plants that I discussed tonight are perfect examples of stranded assets. They are things that TIA ended up owning that were economically worth zero uh, because they were not viable. Uh, so you don't have to wait till the future in order to see that some of these fossil fuel assets have already lost all their value. Um, TIA managed to invest in a couple that already had their asset value go to zero. So um, that's one aspect. The other thing I just want to uh, comment about um, the fiduciary responsibility, it turns out that a lot of the anti-ESG bills have lost steam in the state legislatures recently because they've discovered that ESG is really a risk-based uh, concept and that if they pass these anti-ESG bills, it will cost billions of dollars more for most of these states to make their investments um, if, they, if they follow that track. And so um, there is a lot of uh, common sense financial responsibility here that's built into the whole ESG concept. It's really about risk. I see a question from Carolyn, and, and I just want to follow up uh, and give a little context. Seth spoke about um, in state legislatures, right-wing um, politicians, governors um, have been pushing bills that would make it illegal to um, put pension funds, particularly state pension funds, into screened funds. Um, and that is an effort to force people to ignore the risk of fossil fuels, for instance, um, and a, a coming from the characteristic extreme right in American politics right now. And it's in a great many state legislatures. 
Caroline. Um, well, my question uh, is related to the last one um, and related to the use of media to get attention to this uh, campaign. Because there's such a, a furor in the, in the media right now about this anti-woke uh, or the, the woke, anti-ESG, anti-woke um, investments, it, it does bring up the, it does make ESG funds more interesting to the media. And if we could talk about what TIAA's uh, ESG funds are, um, just bringing that to the attention of the media, it's, it's a way to kind of ride that um, tail and get more, um, get more attention. Apparently there's a, a backlash to the, to the backlash against ESGs. So uh, banks and so forth are saying, no, actually we want to be able to invest in ESGs. It's like, it's our, it's our freedom. It's our freedom to choose to do this. So um, just hoping to see more publicity in that regard. Thank you, Carolyn. I think that's a really interesting point that we can follow up in terms of generating more publicity about this issue. We send the same thing to each of them separately. That, that is up to you. I think the crucial thing is that they get sent okay. um, and that they have an experience of when they open their email tomorrow morning, there is 20, 30, 40, 50 emails into Sunda's, um, Dr. Brown's box and Cecilia Conrad's box um, and that they see that they are hearing from more and more people. And we will repeat and we will repeat until their boxes are full and they recognize that there is an overwhelming demand to end their investments in planetary destruction. Juliana, you have a question or Iris, did you wanna, I think Juliana was first, let's, let's go to Juliana. But it looks like she's sending her question in the chat. Um, and it says that, it's the same question about the organizing efforts and I'll go ahead and take it if that's okay. Unless Iris, were you raising your hand to take this? That's something else. Go ahead, Abigail. Um, yes. So there is a lot of different ways that you can support specifically the organizing efforts. Um, we're doing on-campus efforts like divestment times. We're working with different groups like Climate Justice Cornell, Black Student Union um, at Concordia College. So there's different groups that are getting involved to try to uh, essentially get started. So that's one thing that you could do is if you're involved with an institution. And then the other thing that you could do is write op-eds. Um, we're looking for help with people to like contacts in the word to bottom line more actions. Um, and to answer your question about Signal or Slack, we don't have one right now, but we are in the process of making one. So definitely um, complete that join link so that we can keep you up to date and get you put in when we get that created. And please amplify the voices that we're hearing from frontline communities, um, including today on our webinar, um, and um, emphasize that this is about planetary destruction and it's also about um, social justice and the rights and lives of very often indigenous communities and other frontline communities. Iris. Um. Thanks to everyone who is still staying on this webinar. I really appreciate everyone and especially our speakers. So I just wanted to address a strategy question that's coming up in a number of the, the chat questions in one way or another. And that is this kind of creative tension between individuals wanting to clean the fossil fuels out of their money and get out of TIAA versus our organized campaign to pressure TIAA to divest from fossil fuels and stop land grabs. And just want to encourage people that we're not urging people directly to take your money out of TIAA because we don't really see a great pension fund um, option and we don't wanna be financial advisors. But if you do, um, so our, you know, our whole thing is an organized campaign, it's a pressure campaign. So that's why I put stay and fight in the chat it's fine to stay and fight. If you do decide to take your money out of TIA because of their fossil fuel investments, please make it big, make it public, 
Think about having a party. Think about doing an action. Think about making a little video and sending it to us, letting us put it out on social media far and wide, write an op-ed. Depends on who you are and how you want to do things, but that's, that is definitely an option. But our focus is to organize campaign step-by-step -step concerted actions, and clearly TIA is shaken up. We've been in Bloomberg and Financial Times and Reuters and Higher Ed Dive and you know, inside higher ed and if the media attention really does shake them up, um, they do a lot of pressuring against reporters that try to actually tell the facts about TIA. So they're upset. And that's, that's a good sign that this campaign is working. Thank you. And I'm just going to send a link so that you can join this campaign and continue the pressure. Mm -hmm. So please make sure to fill that out. And thanks everybody for joining today and taking time and listening and acting and exactly what was said. If you didn't get your letters out, please get them out following this and make sure that tomorrow morning they wake up and they have 50 letters in their inbox. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. You will receive all of this information in your inbox and please feel free to reach out with any questions or comments. It was lovely to see you all tonight. And thank you, thank you to our speakers. Night. Thanks, Abigail. Thank you, Abigail, and everyone else at TIA DeVest for having me speak tonight. Thank you. Good show. Thank you for including me and allowing my story to get told. <laughs>